this is undoubtedly the most interesting time to be an MMA fan, the most interesting time to be a combat sports fan, the most interesting time, I'd even say, uh, to be a pro wrestling fan. And I say this to anybody who would listen, right? Anybody who would listen to me, my friends, people I know, that this is undoubtedly the most exciting time to be invested into something like the UFC. Uh, this is the way in uh, on the mic uh, here with me today, is Badr Ali. And this is undoubtedly one of the best times to start a podcast, even though uh, it's not as easy to do, uh, even though it's not as simple as just starting one. But in Pakistan right now, especially, um, there seems to be a rise, uh, a rise which is based off a global trend, of course, of MMA suddenly gaining prominence to such a degree um, that you see the UFC now expanding its markets, uh, expanding its presence um, all over the world. So, yeah, like, you have UFC gym opening up here in Lahore, man. That's like, crazy. It, it's happening. I mean, all I know, us. I know the criticisms that come with it. I've asked people uh, yeah. who are actually on the MMA scene, who are actually fighters and trainers, and uh, people who who actually compete, so to speak, or are at least s- deep into the uh, MMA machine of Pakistan, so to speak. Uh, and they say that the the UFC gym uh, here, I think it's on Rivand, I'm not sure, yeah. um, isn't much of, uh, you know, the UFC expanding its, excuse me, operations in Pakistan, but more of just, you know, a cash grab opportunity to use the marketing label uh, in order for them to get uh, people coming in there and training. Uh, but that's a good indicator. And I'm not shitting on the UFC gym. I've never been there. I don't know who's running it. I don't know how it works. Uh, but nonetheless, regardless of what the perception of the UFC gym may be, and the fact that Brave FC uh, came to Pakistan this last year, the fact that we have Sarai Fight Night um, happening uh, just in August, I believe. I should know this. I was I was kind of <laughs> there. <laughs> but I don't, I don't really remember. Uh, but Sarai Fight Night um, and the UFC gym and Brave, these are all indicators to the fact um, that like uh, all over the world, uh, MMA, especially through the UFC and all other uh, organizations that exist for MMA, uh, seems to be on the rise. MMA seems to be the thing which is now capturing people's imagination. You can trace it back to wherever you want to trace it back to. But nonetheless, it is now here in Pakistan as well. Um, and my favorite thing is uh, the Sarai Fight Night, which happened very recently when it comes to Pakistan. Yeah, you were the color commentator, man. And you were the ring announcer as well. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Dude, that was literally my dream job. And that gave me enough confidence to feel as if um, I, I, I could talk about these things because this was the first time I'd ever seen an MMA fight live, believe it or not. I've always watched uh, from home or from the comfort of your home, <laughs> which is where we mostly uh, watch our events. Uh, but just to be there live, just to get to see it all happening, just to be involved in uh, the operations of the event, which was, by the way, in my opinion, in my very uh, novice opinion, so to speak, uh, perhaps the best MMA uh, show locally produced, sourced, and then executed uh, in Pakistan. At least that's that's how I looked at it. And from many, many, many fronts. Um of course, there was there are certain things that need to be fixed in terms of the production quality. If you go watch uh, the fights back on YouTube, which you can do so uh, at any point, uh, it's all up there for free. If you watch it, you can tell there's some production glitches, like the music goes off in between fights, uh, you know, replays and the little images. Uh, sorry, I won't call them images. Good graphics talking about fighter stats and so on and so forth aren't exactly too neat. Um, and, and other such production things where what camera to cut to, uh, my name wasn't spelled properly, which was kind of horrendous. <laughs> I mean, that was, it, it just hurt, right? That's all I'm saying. I was there for four hours doing, oh, I'm kidding, it's totally fine. Uh, but these things, uh, yeah, these things need to be fixed. But, it's yeah, but do you honestly think that these things are like that, that large in terms of magnitude and how much no. they affect what people are going to be? I think the event was still great. Yeah, no. The event I think considering that it was the though. first time that you had female fighters on a card, it was the first time that you had like an organized MMA event where people were paid, man. Yeah. It was, it was like no, I mean, fighters do get breaking. paid, uh, but but just the fact. And and see, I've I've heard stories of, and I've generally like, uh, so I, I've been affiliated, not really affiliated, but I've been around uh, the people at Rogue MMA, just really amazing people to train with, work with. Um, I would be training there regularly if it wasn't for my shoulder, <coughs> which got dislocated uh, two weeks ago, right? And yeah, it did get shoulder. Again, you should know this. I should know this. It's better <laughs> now, uh, but it really popped out of its socket uh, and everything. And But I've been around uh, people at Rogan. They're such great people. And generally, 
uh, the notion is that there's adverse conditions under which fighters have to not only travel but stay but then cut weight and then show up to make weight and then go back and then rehydrate and then come to show up to, to fight the next time basically it was it's never all under one roof so to speak mm. um, this event was unique primarily because fighters got to stay in a hotel that's crazy i don't think that has been done by any kind of I mean, correct me if i'm wrong uh, but to my knowledge it hasn't been done by anybody here in pakistan to give fighters the facilities um, to stay in a hotel uh, fighters were comfortable they had to make weight just to the hall next to the lobby downstairs then there was a press conference which is you know like i've never heard of this happening in pakistan a lot a lot of us for us it's a first um, and it's a positive indicator and like you said the first ever female mma fight in pakistan history if at least that's how it was marketed i believe that is the first female mma fight in pakistan did they have been brave did brave have a female fight i'm not really sure i should know this but i don't uh and but i, I know women compete in uh, jiu jitsu uh in judo and so on and so forth yeah, but yeah. just the mma aspect and and you know what the biggest positive indicator uh, for me at least uh, as a fan and somebody who wants to be involved in the sport locally uh, was the fact that a lot of people there's a lot of acceptance when it comes to uh, just the event itself or the ring girls man <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah see uh, everybody talks about the ring girls <laughs> and you're right to point that out that is insane if you think about it, it it's part of the acceptance factor man that there was there was so much that happened which makes you think that this was just a conventional MMA event that was happening anywhere but pakistan yeah but it was happening in pakistan yeah and i i just don't understand man was, how did that happen it was insane like it i said the production glitches and the gaps in production are things that we can forgive primarily yeah. because it's leading up to a bigger positive uh for the mma scene and just the oh so okay so the ring girls right okay uh, now that was amazing primarily because i never ever imagined <laughs> that would be something that i would see um uh, the day of the event uh it was a lot of chaos uh before the event started and i'm not a whistleblower to say these things i'm not outing a secret that there was chaos backstage of course the first ever event of such a scale such of a course large scale, there's going to be chaos man of course there's going to be some kind of you know but there was a lot of it and uh we had to sort things out and get the entrances done and um all the production crew had to get their things together in a couple of hours so on so on so forth um and i remember i was asked and i had to prepare my commentary notes um which was like 12 fights right now also had to uh, my script was changed in the last minute which yeah, is yeah that was uh, that was really sad because i saw you <laughs> with yeah. those those like chart papers and then yeah. all of those you know printouts uh, yeah. and then properly feeding everything into that and then preparing your sheets yeah, i and made then yeah cue cards <laughs> I, i made proper flash cards before i left lahore to for islamabad um and when i got there Uh, those flashcards had the whole sequence of fighting out of the red corner blank yeah. and then weighing in and blank and all of that um like a ring announcer would right uh but they told me and i guess it was it was a lack of communication and a lack of you know us being able to get on the same page sooner because i got there just two days before the event which is kind of my bad sorry but um when was the day of the event they said no the script has to change um and it changed and i had to fill all of that out do the commentary notes and i was running over everything and then as i was freaking out um they told me to go backstage for just a bit and i said okay i'll see what's up so i went so i go backstage um and there's where i met, met uh miss bina right and uh miss bina is a fashion designer if i'm not wrong and she's the uh she's the woman who was more or less in charge of the ring girls and you know bringing them in their costumes and and there's i think uh, a few other people involved in that whole process as well i'm sorry if i'm forgetting any important names i probably am forgetting all of the important names but <laughs> i remember miss bina cuz she told me to give his her ring girls a fabulous introduction and i said uh <laughs> you know how do i cuz i was already at this point freaking out and she just said uh you know just give them a fabulous introduction i said okay how about this and now the ring girls of sfn and she looked at me and she said perfect <laughs> as, if, as if i did something but and 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 that was where i was like all right they're probably i didn't see the ring girls yeah i was like okay they're, they're probably going to come out whatever then i see them come out and as soon as they entered the cage i was about to do my first introduction that's when it hit me i was like holy shit we're in pakistan like in yeah. all of in all of the you know <laughs> mishap that was happening at the event when i first saw the ring girls it it really stuck out to me <clears throat> as a sign that this is the direction that we're going in yeah but which is good which is a globally 
um, accepted standard, which is that at fight events, there are ring girls. And doesn't matter what your social context is to, to a very large, I think it does matter to some degree, mm. but to a very large degree, it doesn't need to matter if you're putting on sport. And the crowd accepted it. Nobody booed, nobody whistled, nobody was disrespectful, nobody hissed at them, nobody called them names or anything. They respected them. And that's exactly what we need more of. I yeah, think. but like on the topic of ring girls and acceptance, again, I feel like that since this was the first event, maybe it didn't get that much publicity. Mm-hmm. Not as much as... So what I'm trying to say is that probably there's a cutoff. There's a cutoff where there are enough people watching something like this where you get um, this this kind of um, this kind of yeah this kind of backlash coming in this kind of um, social perception that's yeah. like kind of rampant in yeah. Pakistan about like you know these sorts of things, particularly ring girls and you know like. Th- there could be this backlash. Yeah, I no, don't, for I, sure. I think that at some point during this progression of the MMA scene, as we transition from being nascent to somewhat more established, I yeah. think this is going to happen. Oh, but the th- PSL, my my good sir, I will tell you, does have cheerleaders. Yeah. And so, so, I mean, I don't <clears throat> think it's as maybe big a deal as it might just be totally okay um, as long as it's in the confines of the event itself. But uh, what I'm... See... The, the acceptance of that kind of um, you know presentation is one thing, and let's just mm-hmm. call it presentation because that's what it was all a part of. Yeah, um, having me there constantly in the cage because I could have done most of my job from the commentary desk would have been easier because I was doing two things: I was going mm-hmm. back and forth and back and mm-hmm. forth. And they're like, "No, you have to be in the cage," and that presentation is very important. Um, and there was an acceptance to it, but more than the presentation aspect, which is of course very important if you're putting out a product for people to watch. What was really interesting was the fight acceptance or the acceptance of just how MMA works. Because being nascent in its growth, uh, it's very important for us to realize and understand uh, that people still might have a hard time coming to terms with how MMA works. So, for example, one test in my mind for a crowd or any kind of, uh, you know, an arena where you might be having an event as to whether... Uh, you know, whatever you're doing is working or not in terms of MMA, is if somebody lands a takedown, does the crowd cheer? Because mm. oftentimes, if you even if you watch live in a lot of these American arenas where MMA takes place, the crowd sometimes boos or, you know, does not appreciate the grappling art. It's the blood mongering. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the blood mongering saying that, you know, Maru Igustri, we just keep uh. hitting each other constantly until somebody drops and dies. And that's not what MMA is. Mm. MMA is way more technical than that. And the Pakistani crowd, at least this one, which was, I mean, in, from the production quality standpoint, it didn't seem too loud because there were no crowd mics. Uh, but at the event itself, it was pretty, pretty, pretty loud in there. And anytime anybody would clinch up, get a takedown, get a mount position, and that's why you'd hear me and Etisham Kareem, who, by the way, was a lot of fun to work with on the <laughs> night as a... Um, you know, as a <coughs> uh, color commentator, I guess. Uh, oh, I dude, his input was fantastic. Yeah, his input was fantastic. He's mm. such a good... The way that he understands the game was just... V- he yeah. was the perfect fit for that You spot. can tell, like, if you'd hear me say something and then hear him say something, <laughs> you can tell that there's a difference in terms of, you know, me watching the sport and him having executed yeah. it. Yeah, but, um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun to work with. Uh, he was a lot of fun to work with. But we were speaking so loudly into the mics uh, during the event. Because the crowd was so loud, we couldn't even barely hear each other for the most part. Um, and that was fantastic. That's exactly what we need uh, in, in Pakistan. It's a very good indicator that people do want MMA here. Yeah. Uh, all of my friends and you guys that I told about the event, uh, you guys loved it in the sense that at least you watched it and you told me that it was fun to watch uh, the fights are fantastic the main event was so good um uh, and you know the co-main event was a lot of fun as well there were some really fun knockouts and finishes two ninja choke finishes oh, dude, ninja choke. i don't even know what a ninja choke apparently it's like a dars except <laughs> your body's supposed to be a little more yeah, separated uh, from the person's yeah, torso about but the hip positioning i think i think so but again i, I don't know what a ninja choke is uh, but I'm a fan of the sport, so <laughs> we can we can talk a lot about that. Uh, but see, when it comes to the SFN, uh, what I'm excited for moving forward is the events that they're going to put on uh, in different cities. It's more of a touring brand, right? So the next one, at least uh, to my knowledge, this is not breaking news or anything. This is just something that I've heard. The next one's probably going to be in Peshawar. Uh, and Peshawar, I think, would be a very great market for MMA, uh, primarily because a lot of the fighters on the card are from Peshawar. Um, and <coughs> since I had to do the introductions, I remember. Um, and 
that's a, that's good for them in terms of traveling distance, but also inter- good in terms of like home crowd advantage. And of course, the yeah. Zalmi group. You can't mention SFN without mentioning the Zalmi group. I was told that a lot uh, during the fight week. Is that good for good reason? The Zalmi group under Javed Afridi, I believe is his name. Um, they're the ones who are really bringing in a lot of the investment, a lot of the uh, the setup costs, so to speak, that may in, you, that you may incur as an organization. These guys are completely bypassing it uh, and just making things easier. So the Zalmi group, of course, uh, is well most well known for Peshawar Zalmi, which is uh, one of the teams in the IPL's Indian, right? I'm looking at a smile because PSL. Thank you. PSL. Clearly, this is not the cricket podcast. For that, please go listen to the Leading Edge. That guy knows what he's. Shanavar knows exactly what he's talking about, not us. But yeah, he's in the the PSL. We have Peshawar Zalmi, um, and these guys, of course, have a base, very obvious base in Peshawar. A mm. lot of the fighters were sponsored uh, by Peshawar Zalmi in the main and co-main event. Um, and the interesting thing, at least the way they're setting up uh, this format, is right now you have a problem in Pakistani MMA, at least in my mind, which is you can't say that there doesn't exist an audience or doesn't exist a market that a market doesn't exist for MMA uh, without ever trying to create a market. For MMA, right? Because right now the problem is the people could want to watch MMA in <coughs> Pakistan, but the biggest problem is that there exists a lack of avenues for them to actually watch and appreciate the sport. This is one of those examples where the Zalmi groups pumped in a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of their exposure that they have. Their YouTube channel has thousands of subscribers. I don't remember how many. Um, but the video, SFN, the whole four hour video has at least, last I checked, 8,000 views, which is pretty good if you ask mm. me and then it was broadcasted on the zalmi tv on, on national television as well so this is what we need we need more people um, coming in and putting in the, uh, this kind of an investment and of course an event in peshawar backed by the peshawar zalmi group and that's gonna be pretty massive yeah and the format at least what i learned uh, from people backstage at sfn is that um, this was the first uh, fight night contender series uh, so these are contenders who are going to come out through contender series events Right, so the the guys who won in this card, uh, and then the guys who win on the next card, uh, are gonna be front runners to be on SFN one. This is this wasn't SFN one by the way. This was SFN Fight Night Contender Series one. SFN one is going to be the big event, which is probably gonna be in another four four months, and that's where the con- all the contenders come in, and all the big names of Pakistan are going to be contacted and asked to come fight. Um, at SFN against potentially international opponents that they're going to fly in, take care of, and all of that. Um, that's not unheard of. A lot of guys yeah. from Afghanistan um, have come fought in Pakistan over the years. A lot of guys, I'm sure, from other nationalities as well. Not that I would know too well. But yeah, I mean, this is this is essentially the plan moving forward. And I think this kind of a central growth in an MMA organization is exactly what you need for the Pakistani scene, and as you can tell, I'm super duper excited about it. Yeah, uh, and yeah, the first first women's fight. Uh, I don't. Did we already talk about it? I don't think we did. We did talk about a this. little bit, but yeah, I mean, it was crazy to see um, that that's happening. I mean, it's 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 a step in the right direction. This is exactly what we need to do. This is exactly what we need to make sure keeps happening. Uh, but yeah, that's Pakistan, and the Pakistani MMA scene is only gonna rise up from this moving forward. And I think if, if anybody watching here is from the Pakistani MMA scene, please be our guest. Um, let us know what you literally do. be our guest. <laughs> 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 like literally be a guest on the show if you want to. But more than anything else, give us your input. Um, correct us where you think we're wrong. Come and talk to us about something that you might think is a little contentious or whatever just but 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 please uh, th- this we, we the reason we started this show is because we realize um that the pakistan mma scene is starting it's growing it's it's on the rise it's always been there uh, but really now is the time where people are starting to get more eyes mm-hmm. on the sport and i'll make an argument here just a little bit of an argument um obviously most of uh the promotional aspect of mma uh comes from you know the way local talent is positioned produced and then marketed to the masses right but one guy in my opinion one guy right who has single-handedly perhaps been the biggest contributing factor uh to the growth of mixed martial arts in let's just say muslim countries all around the world it's khabib Nurmagomedov. <clears throat> that guy and I, I say this because i was in the u.s right when khabib versus connor happened and I'll just out myself right now. I am a Conor McGregor fanboy. Um, and the, the reason I started watching the sport was because of Conor. So I cannot be disingenuous to myself and say that I do not like Conor. Um, even now, after all of the things he's done, 
I do believe there's a lot wrong with him <laughs> and he needs to really fix himself. <laughs> but I'm always going to be a Conor McGregor fan. Undisputed, no doubt, I don't care. Um, and when it was happening, Khabib versus Conor, when I was in the US, uh, my friends started sending me these clips that were running in local news channels um, of Khabib. Or Khubeb, as my dad <laughs> likes to call him. Uh, it's a lot of people call him here, Khubeb. I don't know where that came from. Uh, but yeah, <coughs> Khubeb um, is a is a hero here. And and the news headlines were talking about how Connor smashed... The, uh, sorry, Khabib. I wish Connor. But like, <laughs> Con- Khabib smashed this loud mouth, drunk Irishman who was this, that, and the other. And called Khabib's manager a terrorist or, you know, all of that. And But ultimately, that's exactly what got eyes on the sport. And now... For the first time ever, I've seen so many people in Pakistan give a shit about a UFC card. That's not even so stacked if you're being really am- honest in comparison. Yeah, honestly, man. Like, because there are not a lot of people who know who Curtis Blades is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Ismi, do you know who Curtis Blades is? Yeah, exactly. Like, but you know who Khabib is. Yeah, yeah there yeah. we go. That's 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 basically all you need to know about. And and see, no cr- no credit being taken away from Dustin Poirier and Edson Barboza and Bob Felder, who are all amazing fighters, and I would watch their fights. I would get up at 5 a.m. to, and I do get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> to watch their fights. Um, but Khabib really is be- has become perhaps one of the biggest draws in the UFC. Um, and he's, I think, <clears throat> what I've seen him do and I, what I've seen Nate Diaz do um, over the course of the last few years has come to terms with the fact that, okay, it was always used to, you know, the first narrative where we saw Khabib come out and Challenge Connor, Challenge Connor was... Um, saying they not want to fight your chicken whatever that means right uh, which means he wants to fight Connor of course we know what it means but why would he say that because it's so um, adversarial towards Dana White saying that this is your boy you're protecting him I want to fight him Nate Diaz said the same thing called him out in a similar fashion said I know what you're trying to do I'm the fight that this guy should get you're not going to give him to me but now Diaz and Khabib have both understood something which is very crucial to understand which is Dana White will love you it does not matter who you are as long as you move that needle. Yep. And Nate Diaz has become the biggest needle mover in the UFC. Uh, one of the biggest needle movers, pardon me, in the UFC. Khabib has become, has opened so many markets for the UFC. Right now, I think he is the biggest needle mover. I mean, I who agree. else do you have? You I had DC, but then DC I got... Mean, I would never. I love DC to death. DC is one yeah. of my favorite fighters. But I would never say DC is the biggest needle mover. John Jones is the same... Thing. When John Jones and DC are fighting, perhaps, uh, because just of how their history is and, you know, everything. But if you see DC, Derek Lewis, it didn't do tremendously amazing numbers. Yeah. Take a look at John Jones versus Thiago Santos, which is the main event uh, yeah. of the last card John Jones was on. Didn't do amazing numbers. Didn't touch millions, basically. Uh, but if you put Khabib on a card, uh, just not based on pay-per-view buys, but the international... Uh, imprint that it leaves uh, for the UFC. I'm talking millions and millions of people uh, just absolutely loving what they're seeing. And that's that's exactly, you're correct. Khabib probably is the biggest needle mover in the UFC right now because he targets a demographic. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's important to hear this uh, from people, uh, you know, who share the perspective of, you know, like I, I remember Conor McGregor being the talk of, you know, Pakistan to, to, to a large degree when he first rose um, mm. in terms of the fan bases here the everyone Pakistan. was sharing that 13 second knockout yeah. of Aldo yeah that was that the was that was one thing I remember when Brock Lesnar jumped over the UFC that's where a lot of people I would refer to them as casual fans but that sounds a little disrespectful but people who don't normally watch the UFC let's put it like that um, a lot of people suddenly got interested and now when Khabib smashed Connor and this last card everybody was just you know, so he they yeah. are needle movers. I, I think like the best the best instance where I kind of realized how much Khabib moves that needle is when Dominic Cruz went on this entire rant about how you know Khabib's fighting in his home country and how he has to represent so many people. And Dominic Cruz is amazing. Yeah. Dominic Cruz is just a great analyst. He's a great fighter, and he has a lot of knowledge of the sport. But even he didn't know that Khabib's Russian, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, Dagestani, actually. Dagestani, yeah. man, which is po- po- like a province yeah, I, in Russia. I, I, thought, I thought that was really funny. Um, but you know what that means, right? That means that Khabib just gets that entire demographic. Yeah. That means that he's not really Dagestani. That means he's not from Abu Dhabi. That, that just means that he represents this entire demographic of like 1.7 billion people. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's... Yeah. It, 
it's right, it's yeah. intense man like there there like there's a lot of publicity behind this one person now that's yeah. kind of like carrying this entire scene it's crazy and you know like i thought that was i don't know if it was intentional i don't know if they just didn't know <laughs> uh but like it it sounded kind of derogatory i don't want to put my pc cap on here and you know but as somebody who is you know uh who can sort of relate i mean we were going to go we were going to go try to see uh, yeah. Khabib versus Poirier and uh, that didn't work out for reasons beyond our control such as the fact that we're broke or you know <laughs> that. broke see that but yeah um inside jokes ladies and gentlemen uh but yeah uh we were about to go there and and watch this uh but then when John Anik and Dominic Cruz were talking about um you know Khabib's here um uh, to fight for these people <laughs> for his people <laughs> for these people i mean <laughs> listen just cuz they're muslim and he's muslim and we're muslim doesn't mean that it's a separate s- class of yeah. human being <laughs> Sudden, suddenly oh this is this is the hero for all the people i'm sure there are a lot of people who w don't like me yeah uh, come on you know it just it just seems weird it's like a jewish guy <laughs> if there was ever an openly jewish fighter whatever that looks like i can't, I can't even imagine like with the little cap Ariel hawani and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if Ariel hawani shows up to israel uh, in israel to fight like i don't know uh what's that guy's name uh, brad okamoto right and then dominic cruz just going these are his people <laughs> like no dude he's from uh, toronto uh, <laughs> like it, it, it uh, but yeah i thought that was a little ignorant. i was still thought it was a little fun Uh, but it's all good of course like who who really cares nobody uh what we what people really care about uh, is the fight itself yeah well, how do you think the fight went <sighs> see that's a, okay as a conor fan <laughs> i'll just <laughs> i just start that off from there as somebody who support conor mcgregor and will support conor mcgregor in his fighting endeavors purely his fighting endeavors um uh, until conor stops fighting uh for the fifth time <laughs> but as as somebody like that i'm waiting for the day and as a dc fan I s- for some reason always pick the losers in these rivalries but as a Conor fan and DC fan I always hope and pray that today's the day that I witness Khabib or John Jones absolutely get destroyed so I can go to sleep easy at night and every time these guys fight that answer ke- that question keeps getting prolonged how do you beat Khabib Nurmagomedov how do you beat John Jones it's almost impossible at this point for different reasons we can analyze both of them a little differently John Jones of course utilizes his reach to advantage um utilizes absolute uh you know with the best mind in MMA so to speak mm-hmm. uh, i would say uh, khabib utilizes a completely different foray of uh, skills that he brings to the octagon and we saw that in this fight uh the big question has been how comfortable khabib would be with the boxer in pocket range we saw him almost get hit i guess a bunch of times didn't really get hit but the fight itself was just a testament to not just how good Khabib's wrestling is which is how what people keep saying right i keep uh hearing a lot of people on the and internet that, saying yeah. that he's just a good wrestler right and wrestling always beats kickboxing that's not true that's not true he's an amazing yeah. ground specialist that means every aspect of the ground game wrestling jiu jitsu uh even striking from top uh everything that he needs to do just his pressure his relentless pressure even in those clinch positions where he uses those trips uh which he used in this fight as one well, every fight just to get the guy off their base and then after that it's Khabib's game. Uh it was just a display of that. Dustin Poirier is a black belt as of 2017. Yeah. A black belt. Khabib and I <laughs> I saw I saw this um picture on Twitter of Khabib uh you know training for in jiu-jitsu with uh some jiu-jitsu instructor professor I don't know and he's wearing a white belt. It was like oh so so humbling this that no he just might as well be a white belt because he's never trained gi yeah right but keep that in mind where this guy's ground game is so phenomenal that he made a black belt look like a blue belt in the octagon it's absolutely manhandling mm-hmm. yeah like we were talking about this earlier as well like th- those 35 seconds like where where <laughs> dustin poirier had him clinched up tightly had him wrapped in that guillotine there was no for- he was going purple man and then like 35 seconds later he's tapped out poria he's taken his back and he's just tapped him out the, it was just yeah. phenom the way that he trans the way that he just took his back at every single opportunity he got and the way that he was just two or three steps ahead of poria was kind of frightening like all of those instances where poria would try to sweep him it's like khabib would already have an answer to that yeah it it was just phenomenal it's like you can on the striking i felt like um 
Khabib still handles it. Like I think it was round two when Poirier yeah. started to get some good strikes yeah. and he caught him a couple of times. Yep. But Khabib was fine. He just kind of you know just moved his head around a bit and he was he was okay. Then he, he was, was back out. on that pressure. Yep. One two and then shoot, and then when you shoot, there's no coming out of it. Um, he just so good at all of these Dagestani wrestlers on the card. Uh, it wasn't just Khabib, right? Uh, if you watch Islam's fight, if you watch uh, Zubera. Uh, Zub- Zubair Tahukov I can't say his name the guy who punched Connor basically who got a split draw oh, um, and yeah. Zubair Tahukov I believe is his name or something to that effect uh, but Zubair if you watch all their fights they're very good at um, getting the legs of their opponent uh, in between their legs whenever they're on top of them yeah. so there's literally zero to none mobility we've seen Khabib utilize this for so many fights now it worked perfectly in this one as well um, and again just made a bona fide black belt jiu-jitsu look like an absolute just like there was no chance for him to come out and of it. Dude, like think about it. Dustin Poirier's last fight was yeah. against Max Holloway's debut at lightweight. Yeah. And he he convincingly just beat Max. Yeah. And th- he just he just got treated like any other opponent Khabib's ever had. Like this was what Khabib's twelfth fight in the UFC, twenty eight yeah. and 0 and twelve and 0 in the UFC. Yeah. And all of those fights have almost gone the same way. Either he stops you by tapping you out or by just punching you so hard that you just can't continue, or he just goes the distance with that. It's like Khabib could be Khabib could go for like a, a twelve round fight with someone and be fine yeah. after. Remember after the fight he's walking out and he's not even sweating, man. Yeah, <laughs> Khabib Nurmagomedov has never been cut inside the octagon. If Khabib has wrong. never been taken down. Never been taken down. Never cut. Uh, oh wait, have, has he been taken down? I think he was one fight. No, uh, but I've never been taken down. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just you know this guy's resume, thirty years of age, he's in his prime right now. Uh, of course, his his major ascent started. Uh, maybe the first notable win was uh, R- RDA uh, back in 2014. Then of course 2016. Mm, Michael Johnson. Yeah, Michael Johnson in the USC yeah. 205 undercard. Then he beat Edson Barboza convincingly. Um, just absolutely mauled him. And then he got the title finally against Ali Quinta. Uh, we all remember what happened with Conor McGregor. Um, I remember really well. Uh, and of course, this this performance, again, we're still at the question, how do you beat Khabib, 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 well, Khabib Nurmagomedov inside the octagon? A lot of people have theorized that perhaps it could be a striking advantage in terms of pressure. It could be a striking advantage in terms of how much volume you output. It could be a striking uh, advantage in terms of just how well you can stuff the takedown, keep the fire on the feet, <coughs> and then eventually it could be, you know... For some reason, Conor kept saying Khabib has a glass chin um, during the press conferences, which, again, makes no sense, like most things Conor's is <laughs> doing these days. Um, but yeah, there's no such thing as a glass chin on Khabib, at least that we've seen tested so far. Uh, I guess the only perceivable way or the only conceivable way that you could be Khabib Nurmagomedov is by keeping the uh, fight standing, fight standing, but to a certain extent also be an offensive grappler on the ground. Um, and that man's name... Something like Tony, Tony Ferguson. Ferguson. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that's what's... So what's next for Khabib to a certain degree has to be Tony Ferguson. I mean, nothing else makes sense as of right now. I mean, yeah. I, the, Khabib was asked at the post-fight press conference if he thinks he wants to fight uh, Tony Ferguson next. He said, uh, right now I want steak, cheese, and burger. Right? <laughs> and then I'm going to go, my next opponent is burger. Right? <laughs> I'm going to eat burger. Please, guys, can you relax? You know, like <laughs> that's what he said. Um, so it's either Connor or Tony. I don't want to bring Connor into the conversation. For I don't me. think Connor. Connor doesn't get the title shot, man. See, He's there's done. there's where you may be wrong in terms of whether he gets the title shot or not versus whether he deserves it or not. Can we just okay? Yes or no question. I'll count to three and then we say it. Does Connor deserve a title shot against Khabib next? One, two, three. No, no. right? That's just <laughs> not much of a. Ismail even said no uh, in whatever capacity he could. But like, he does not deserve the next title shot. Um, any way you look at it. Um, actually, <laughs> why, why not look up Conor McGregor's uh, last few uh, fights in terms of his record? Conor McGregor, right after the fight, tw- <laughs> tweeted out, book my rematch in Moscow, right? And this this brings up the Dana White meme with Russia, <laughs> like that one. Um, and 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 again, it it sure you know like it, it, that's a big fight for you to make as a promoter. Um, that's a that's a really great opportunity to get the biggest 
uh, or the closest thing to Rocky IV happening with, you know, Rocky going to Russia and then fighting this guy on steroids, except Khabib's not on steroids. He's just a monster. Uh, but yeah, Connor hasn't won a fight since 2016. Uh, put that in context. His last win was Eddie Alvarez, Eddie 2016, Alvarez, yeah. UFC 205 in November. Uh, after which he decided to take a hiatus from MMA and pursue other ventures, namely boxing, uh, in which was that wasn't really interesting, uh, where he lost to Floyd Mayweather. Nonetheless, good showing, whatever. Comes back then, 2018, absolutely gets whooped, right? Uh, and this is also keeping in mind that he's lost to Nate Diaz at some point, who I guess has, that was really his coming out party, so you shouldn't. And I don't like how people said, he tapped Nate, he top, tapped to Khabib. These guys aren't bad fighters in any way, nor are they guys that you can just say, oh, he's tapped to some nobodies. Nate Diaz right now and Khabib right now are at the top of their game in their respective divisions. Yeah. Welterweight and uh, lightweight. Well, Nate's <clears throat> not champ, but nonetheless, yeah, We Nate saw Nate's done. last fight, man. How that work out for Anthony Pettis? It was amazing one-sided performance once again. So what I'm saying is, uh, Connor, if 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 we believe anything that he's ever said about him being a martial artist and this and that, uh, it's an obvious choice for him to go back to the drawing board, uh, get a win, not for Khabib's sake, not because Khabib's asking him to get a win, but simply because he needs to go through at least one contender before he's warranted a title shot. Because the trade-off for Connor getting a title shot in Moscow, in, I don't know, Ireland, in Brazil, in Pakistan, I don't care where it is. It doesn't matter. Connor getting a title shot means Tony Ferguson still hasn't gotten a crack at the Undisputed. Dude, game. even at this point, you know, the the fight right before the main event, Even I think Paul Felder even deserves the title shot more than McGregor at this point. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't go that like, far. I didn't agree with that decision, but no, no, no. no. Yeah, so even yeah. so, just trying to put it out there that Conor McGregor has like not been part of the lightweight division for so long. He hasn't been part of any other division because he 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 left the rankings. Yeah. Because he went, he became a boxer. Then all of a sudden. You bring him back in. I get it. He was the first double champ. He moves the needle. He gets that shot. But he he lost it. He he convincingly got beat by Khabib. I think the only step after this is to try to, you know, get humble. Try to put your whiskey business aside for a little bit and try to take on a contender. Yeah, and if you look at the lightweight rankings, um, you of course have Khabib Ramagomedov, who's not moving from that uh, championship spot anytime soon or, well, We'll discuss Tony Ferguson in just a second. <laughs> um, you had Dustin Poirier as the interim champ. He's going to definitely get bumped out of the rankings. It'll be interesting to see because Tony Ferguson's number two and Connor's number three. It's going to be interesting to see if they put Dustin uh, below or above Connor. But after that, you have Donald Cerrone and you have Justin Gaethje at four and five who are fighting each other, by the way, this weekend. Mm. We have to watch that one. Yeah. That's, that's going to be fireworks, dude. Okay. Cowboy Cerrone versus Justin Gaethje is a match made in striking heaven. For all those people who are complaining about grappling this and grappling that oh, and dude. wrestling this and <laughs> wrestling that, fine. Get up at 5 in the morning, watch Donald Cerrone and Justin Gaethje beat the absolute dog shit out of each other for, for 25 minutes or less. Uh, and that's <laughs> going to be an amazing fight. Then you have Ali Quinta, uh, number 6, who Khabib's already beat. Edson Barboza, who Khabib's already beat. Kevin Lee at 8, who Khabib's already beat, even though they haven't fought. <laughs> 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 Anthony Perez, um, who's uh, just coming off his loss to Nate Diaz. Paul Felder is definitely going to go up the rankings. You have Gregor Gillespie, who's uh, actually just recently... Uh, been a part of the worst call out of all time. Uh, Greg Gillespie was eating a bowl of Wheaties um, and said, Hey, everybody's been asking me to call somebody out. So, Showtime Pettis, let's go. And then, without putting any milk in the Wheaties, he just takes a bite. The Wheaties is a reference to Anthony Pettis being on the Wheaties box. Um, and then he just wanted to make it look casual as if, you know, he's just eating Wheaties and, Hey, Anthony Pettis, let's go. But he didn't put any milk in there. And, and Uncle Chill broke this down perfectly. It made me cringe as well. But Gregor Gillespie is in the rankings, is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I have Charles Oliveira, Alexander Hernandez, Dan Hooker. <laughs> Dan Hooker is fighting um, uh, Ala Quinta, which is going to be a fun fight because Dan Hooker has been on quite a yeah. roll recently. He's, he's really come. Uh, do his own and then Islam Makachev of course who fought this week very impressive showing for Islam as well mm, uh, got a convincing decision uh, over Hamos and I think that was a great fight uh, but yeah this is what the lightweight division looks like and if you really think about it the only obvious choice is we're not going to look be below Con Connor because Donald Trump is not getting a title shot Gagey's not getting a title shot Yaquinta's not getting a title shot and then everybody else not getting a title shot anyway so Connor Tony that's literally the only two options that you have for Khabib next, next opponent right? unless GSP comes out of retirement or so, something like <laughs> that cuts weight yeah <laughs> cuts weight to 155 because Khabib said in the post fight presser that he's not going up to welterweight um, between Connor and Tony the logical choice 
logical, simple, rational choice is the guy who has been on a 12 fight undefeated streak. The guy who's held the interim title and never lost it. The guy who tripped on a wire before we were robbed of getting to see two of the best lightweights, in my opinion, of all time go head to head. And that's Tony Ferguson. Uh, from a marketing perspective, I don't like this argument that Connor moves the needle more than Tony and Wood. That doesn't matter at this point. Yeah. I feel like at some level, like even if you are a promotion, you have to give the due respect to the sport yeah. and the practice of mixed martial arts. Yeah. And if it comes to that right now, I feel like Tony Ferguson has like such a better say of getting a title shot than McGregor simply because he's been proving it. Yeah. And more than that, it's... See, marketing an MMA fight is not as simple as is Conor more popular or is Tony more popular. Uh, it's about, you know, they say styles make matchups and I say matchups make marketing opportunities. Khabib versus Tony, you don't need to break a bus. <laughs> you don't need to break bus, as Khabib <laughs> would say. You don't need to throw Dolly in order for you know, a fight to sell. You have two guys who have been on a collision course for years 2015, now. 2015, I think, was the first time that fight was put. I was put. about to look that up. I'll yeah, believe dude. you. Sure. 2015. <laughs> 15 or 16, man. But, but these guys have been on a tear for so long. They've been scheduled to fight four times. Four oh. times. Ismail, four <laughs> times these guys have been scheduled to fight. You understand <laughs> that? Four whole times these guys have been scheduled to fight each other. The first time, I believe, Tony uh, got injured. The second the next time, time, somebody else, Khabib got, I don't know. And then the Someone did make happened. Yeah, they didn't make weight. Tiramisu, Khabib didn't make weight, got hospitalized. And then Tony Ferguson tripped, tripped, tripped on, on a, a wire. wire. Tripped on a wire, so smile. He tripped on a wire and the fight got canceled. Can you imagine? That Fine is, margins. You know, like, MMA is a really cruel sport as a fan. <laughs> Primarily because so many of these fights get canceled last minute. But if there's ever a fight, and the only fight as a promoter that I would want to book for a fifth time is Tony and Khabib. Keep them in glass yeah, like capsules. So solitary isolation. Yeah. Don't know, go, go. <laughs> Just keep, keep fight guards in with the them. Them. No wires, no sunglasses in <laughs> door, you weirdo. <laughs> Nothing to that effect. No kicking pipes like Tony Ferguson would. No tiramisu for fat boy Khabib. Nothing. <laughs> just keep these guys as don't just let them fight. Because that's this is the answer to the question that I've been begging to be answered. Tony Ferguson possesses the skills that not Conor McGregor, not Justin Gaethje, yeah. not Cowboy Stroney, not any of these guys. It's Tony Ferguson who possesses a skill set to be in the cage and be offensive enough from bottom, offensive enough from the ground game, creative enough on his on, on, on his feet when it comes to striking to be able to pose so many threats to Khabib that finally he cracks. He's just crazy. Right? He's the perfect amount of crazy to beat Khabib. That's very important. Yeah. You need to be crazy. But on a, on a lighter note, I mean, Conor, Conor and Tony, um, you know, leave them aside for a second. The other guy in this fight, Dustin Poirier, um, it was heartbreaking to see how he, you know, how, how hard the loss hit him yeah. uh, after. I mean, of course, that would hit anybody hard. Uh, Do you think that interview should have happened post fight? Uh, yeah, right I mean he wasn't fight. knocked out. He, he was submitted, but at that scale, I think you kind of need to give someone a bit of time. See, that's a very interesting um, subject here. So yeah, I mean, when, if a fighter is knocked out, I think under any circumstances, don't interview. Yeah, that was that was the Overeem case yeah, study. Right. Yeah, that, that was Overeem it. case study. <laughs> I felt a tap. And that's from like a, a rational perspective. These guys are, just got knocked out. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? So please don't ask them a question about the fight. Um, then the other aspect, of course, the Daniel Cormier situation where, you know, he cried on national television uh, and low lives made fun of him for doing so mm. uh, because they can, they project their own insecure masculinity onto people who are as secure and amazing as Daniel Cormier to say that this guy cried on camera. No, fuck you is what I say if you make fun of Daniel Cormier for, for crying on camera. But... Regardless, um, these are two interesting case studies of why you shouldn't interview a fighter right after a brutal loss like that. But I think in this situation, it also does come down to the prerogative of the fighter itself. I think Dustin Poirier had a lot to say, had some interesting things to, that he wanted to get off his chest um, about being grateful and being humble and being professional and all of that. Um, and I guess he got to do that. And that's fine. I think Dustin Poirier, if nothing else, his stock went up even regardless of a loss because people are not talking about just how good this guy is. Um, he's he's 30, if I'm if I'm not wrong, 30 years of age. 
Um, this guy's been through so much ever since the first Connor loss. He's really come a long way. And now he's at a point where, you know what, uh, he, he deserves every bit of credit that he's given because even against Khabib, we've seen what fighters can do against Khabib. For a guy to get that close with a guillotine against uh, the monster Khabib Nurmagomedov, I think um, you deserve all the credit in the world. But um, the the bigger, you know, like the emotional aspect and everything aside, if you just look at the ground realities of things, Dustin Poirier is considering retirement. Uh, you know, like that. I mean, it's no one's place to tell a fighter when to retire, right? It's no one's yeah. place. But at the same time, this guy who's at the top of the heap after so long, with impressive wins over former champions like Eddie Alvarez, Anthony Pettis. And dude, he's been in this lightweight division forever. This is all he knows. This it's, is all. It's not something he likes to do. This is what he knows how to do. And um, you know, he's a he's a fighter's fighter. Dean Thomas said this is in an interview as well. Who's his coach? Um, that Dustin Poirier, the only thing he knows how to do is fight, and he's okay with that. Yeah. So Dustin has a lot to offer to the sport. I hope he doesn't retire. Um, there's a lot of fun fights at lightweight coming up. Um, Cowboy versus Gaethje, of course, September 15th. And then Aya Quinta versus Dan Hooker on October 6th. So I think that's on USA 244 as well. So, yeah. I mean, any of those fights is really interesting uh, or a good fight uh, for Dustin Poirier, who I honestly don't think should retire. But, you know, what can you say? It's, it's the Gaethje situation again. It's like these fighters train and fight at such an intensity that it takes a toll on you. Yeah. Honestly, especially with Gaethje, because I think Gaethje said so a couple of fights ago that he was planning to retire in what, like three, four yeah. more fights. Yeah. I like, mean, after the Cerrone fight, how many does he have left? I mean, after any, because you know, Gaethje's one of those guys who loves to take punishment and dish it out, which is why this cowboy Gaethje fight's so fun stylistic. Yeah. Because if you look at the two fighters, uh, Cowboy Cerrone needs a certain amount of distance, needs to keep out of the pocket, and needs to throw his Muay Thai combinations so that they land with precision. Gaethje's the guy who's going to be in your face. He's going to throw everything but the kitchen sink and the kitchen sink yeah. uh, and just try to knock you out. Um, so this fight's so exciting, at least, you know, from... And, and these two fights that I mentioned are also interesting for Edson Barboza and Paul, uh, Paul Felder, who just went through a three-round uh, war, so to speak. Uh, it was a really bloody fight, if you think about it. Yeah, l l well, that was kind of controversial. And you, yeah. ag you agree with me yeah, here because yeah, we yeah. saw that fight together. Yeah. But... I felt like um, Barboza confidently took that first round. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he got the takedown in the second round. Yeah, he did. He yeah, did. And, and that was just... Um, so, like, so first, with context, knowing Edson Barboza and his fight style, um, I think that that was just absurd. Just seeing <laughs> him just pick up a, someone and just put him on the ground, knowing yeah. that he's a Muay Thai kickboxing specialist and yeah. that's all he knows. But then all of a sudden he's taking people down and he's keeping them there for yeah. some reason. Yeah. And not to just anyone. More context, Paul Felder, he's great on the ground, man. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, but, but see, here's the thing. I think that was an aspect of his game that we haven't seen before, as in Barboza. Uh, yeah. Or, I mean, I'm sure he's landed a takedown or some takedowns in his yeah, career. Yeah, but even really objectively, stats, but if we if we try to look at this, I mean, there there was, it was pretty clear in the first round and in the second round that Barboza was winning this. In the first round, he was outstriking him. In the second round, he was outstriking him as well. In the third round, I felt like Felder did get an upper hand. Yeah. In terms of the volume of strikes that yeah. he was landing. I mean, so Felder had a pretty um, solid strategy, at least in my eyes, which was okay. he started out and he just um, started thro throwing these big strikes, trying to get in there. And then I felt like Barboza kept punishing him yeah. up until the third round. Yeah. When the third round where Felder kind of figured out that he needs to throw a higher volume. He needs yeah. to just try to catch him and touch him. Combinations, right? Yeah. yeah, punches and bunches. Yeah. But then there was one judge, I forgot his name, but the judge <laughs> gave it 30-27 to she, Felder. She, she gave it 30-27, yeah. But, dude, where? 30-27 to Felder makes absolutely no sense any way you look at it. The first round... Bigger strikes were those body kicks from Barboza. Oh, my those God. Brutal, man. Gunshots. Oh. Like, just absolute gunshots to the gut. It make you kicks. wince when you look at it. My God, that was hard to watch. But those, um, and just generally how much he was hurting Felder. The first round was a little controversial as well because that headbutt, which is accidental. Um, yeah. But, again, any way you look at it in terms of damage, I, I think Edson Barboza took that round. The second round, um, again, Barboza, same story, but this time at least... Um, he definitely got the takedown. And even Paul Felder's corner said, listen, man, it's third round. You got to go out, get a finish. Um, he did enough to get around, but I don't think he did enough 30-27 <laughs> yeah. uh, because the third round suddenly does not change the, uh, you know, 
quantum the, physics <laughs> behind the theory of time and suddenly revert the first two rounds back to you. Uh, but yeah, I, I, this is a controversial decision. I, I, I don't think. But either way, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like it was a ridiculously one-sided fight. It wasn't like Barboza was knocking him down and you yeah. know, rocking him or anything. Oh, dude. It was. It was more of a. You can tell it was a point game going on between those guys. But ultimately, I think he did enough easily. Yeah, I think to uh, Dominic Cruz again put it best, where he was just saying that these fighters, no matter who they may be facing at this point, they would probably beat them. Yeah. Because these two fighters were at their prime. Both of yeah. them showed up, and I just feel like barber and we kind of disagreed before the fight as well um you called it felder yeah in the second round and i called it barbos in the first so we were both kind of wrong <laughs> but dude um uh, mma was, is by the way the worst and hardest sport to ever predict anything on because unlike football or cricket or any of these other sports where you can see a certain kind of form look consistency, at it look at it <laughs> but like a certain kind of form or consistency uh coming into a certain uh you know event or you know this guy is most likely to score you know three goals a match or that's not that's not realistic like one goal a match or is you know whatever strike rate and all these things in mma there's so many invariables when it comes to things such as how a person's feeling on the day what he decides to do the other person uh is and it's not like yeah, a team a sport with a ball right it's literally human beings facing another human being so i have to understand not a team not a coach not a strategy but just how another human being thinks and yeah, one like strike one instance can completely shut down a fight regardless of how much you've been doing well that, that's i think again taking a page out of gsp's book like every time he needs to trash talk someone he's just such an honest guy he's such a nice guy he'll always just say the same thing that on that day yeah. <laughs> in that fight in that fight in that round <laughs> in that second i might yeah. be the better fighter yeah and that's all that is to it right gsp yeah that's exactly <laughs> <laughs> and and i mean that's true it's it's how it should be um and if you look at uh paul felder uh paul felder has had quite a uh, you know, in, in his last one, two, three, four, five fights, he's had only one loss to Mike Perry, and that too was short notice at 170. He's 155 pounder. Uh, he's beat James Wick. Um, he beat him uh, convincingly through a uh, decision, and now Edson Barboza. But is looking bad for uh, Junior Edson Barboza here. Uh, last five fights, he's only had one win against Dan Hooker. He's lost to Paul Felder, Justin Cagey, Kevin Lee, Khabib Nurmagomedov. Um, going and backwards, and of yeah. course, before the Khabib fight was the uh, flying knee KO of Benil Darayush, which was absolutely breathtaking yeah wow. uh, but yeah where did these guys go from here i think there's uh i mean if since paul felder has won regardless of how we looked at the fight uh i think it would be really exciting to see him uh take on the winner of cowboy gaichi or even the winner of yakuinta uh, dan hooker and uh any one of these guys can fight uh barboza next and i think it's really important uh this fight was really important for barboza i think as if uh you know in terms of the last five fights Barboza's had, um, mm. this was a this was one of those fights where you can tell uh, this was this was still e one of those fights that can be easier for him perceivably to win because it was going to stay on the feet for most of the time, uh, and yeah, th for that reason, I think it was a really crucial. Uh, but loss. where do you see Felder going now? Well, where was Felder ranked? F F Felder the currently ranking. is ranked, I think, in the. Uh, mm. at number 10 yeah before yeah, but these fight, aren't yeah these aren't updated yeah these aren't updated it's definitely going to get updated at some point uh, Khabib's called it uh, the press post fight press conference he said that give me the respect I deserve uh, put me at top of the pound for pound number one rankings and I can't argue with you him you can't uh, because he's the level of competition he's fought uh, how convincingly and how dominant fashion he's put away guys not just gone to decisions um, I think we absolutely deserves it but again as long as John Jones is still alive uh, there seems to be quite a question on it, but hey, this is um, this is the a, a point in MMA history I think where so many things are drastically changing, so many things changing that you know we should talk about, uh, so many things changing that you know we take notice of in terms of how fights are being promoted, marketed, uh, in terms of how you know there's a there's a change from how fighters are marketing themselves and Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal is a very good example of that. Um, as, a, as opposed to people like Colby Covington or Conor McGregor. So the trash talk aspect's changing. The global marketing aspect's changing. So many different aspects of MMA are changing. And it's the best, absolute best time to talk about these things. Um, and there's just so much coming up in the world of mixed martial arts that we get to talk about, that we yeah, should man. talk about. <laughs> you have UFC 244, which is turning out to be an absolutely amazing card. Darren Till, Kelvin Gastelum, Johnny Walker, Corey Anderson, and just recently added Nate Diaz. Uh, and uh, Jorge Masvidal, I believe, is on that card. 
uh, just this weekend as well. It's gonna be an amazing fight. Uh, it's just like I said, the start of this podcast, the single best time to be a combat sports athlete. And a fan. And a fan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, meant, <laughs> I meant fan. Uh, single best time to be a combat sports fan. Uh, we hope you become a fan if you aren't already a fan, or at least we hope uh, your fandom increases uh, and increases and increases so that we can all love this beautiful sport yeah. uh, of mixed martial arts. If you are in any way <clears throat> related to uh, the Pakistani mixed martial arts community uh, and you are watching this, first of all, thank you for sticking around for this long. <coughs> Second of all, um, if you want to be a part of On The Mic, if you want to come on the mic and be on the mic, uh, then be our guest. Literally, be our yeah. guest. Um, or at least let us know what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right, uh, how you'd want us to. Because this is a product or this is a podcast that we're trying to start up so that it can help out um, all of the MMA scene in Pakistan. So we can give exposure, shed light, uh, market, broadcast, and essentially target uh, all of the things that are necessary to be targeted uh, for mixed martial arts in Pakistan to grow. Uh, so please leave us a message or let us know or hit us up or just ask for you to be on the show we'd love to have you uh because there's only one thing that we can do well uh well sort of well there's one thing that we want to do here and that's talk mixed martial arts yeah. and talk business and uh yeah this was do you want to say anything to sign off i don't know how to sign off yet. um same i i don't really this know is, but this is where we get really awkward and really yeah. stressful but uh i've been daniel nasir mirza this has been badr ali it's been our absolute pre pleasure and stick around thanks